As I said before, uh, my name is Jordan Grice. I am the clinic communications manager at the Stephen A. Uh, Cohen Military Family Clinic at Veterans Village of San Diego. And today's webinar is entitled Insomnia 101. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Mark Scheidler. He is the prescribing psychiatrist for the Cohen Clinic at VVSD as well as the Cohen Clinic at Valley Cities. Uh, he's a board certified psychiatrist uh, with a professional interest in trauma and sleep. Uh, Dr. Scheidler is also a 28 year Air Force veteran, flight doc and psychiatrist. And he's been with Cohen's Veteran Network for the past year. Um, without any further ado, I wanna introduce Dr. Mark Scheidler. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. And let's talk about insomnia. So what is insomnia? Uh, comes from the Greek word, not sleeping, not a surprise. Um, and it's trouble going to sleep or staying asleep, um, difficulty falling asleep. Waking up during the night uh, when you don't want to wake up during the night or waking up too early and not being able to fall back asleep. Um, next slide. Uh, general symptoms are tiredness, trouble staying awake during the day, irritability, and often people have problems with concentration or memory. Next slide. Um, causes, uh, mental illness is at the top of the list and uh, We'll see why here in a second. Environmental factors obviously play a, a role uh, with, uh, it could be the dog, the neighbor, the, the partner snoring next to you, uh, jet lag, shift work, is, shift work changes. Uh, medical illness can also play a role. Uh, imbibe substances, so anything you take in, that could be medications, could be alcohol, uh, too much caffeine. Pain obviously is a big problem for some people. And as we age, um, our sleeping patterns change, which makes it difficult to get good, long quality sleep. Next slide. But 90% of insomnia is caused by psychological causes and they're obvious. Um, it's stuff that happens inside your brain. Uh, next slide should say inside your mind, not your brain, but inside your mind. Um, when to seek mental health is if you're having sleep problems lasting more than two weeks, sleep onset is greater than 30 minutes. Uh, medical reasons have already been ruled out. You've already been to your doctor and they're like, I don't know what's going on. Uh, obviously, if you have nightmares, uh, that's when you seek mental health help. Uh, using substances um, to go to sleep, it's very common that people use alcohol, Marijuana or pain pills to help them go to sleep. I don't recommend it, but if you find yourself in that position, you may want to seek mental health help. Sleepiness is affecting your day. Um, people will say when they're in a boring meeting or boring situation, right as a passenger in a car, that they get really sleepy. Um, you know it's a mental illness when it's related to your mind racing at bedtime excessive worry at night, uh, anxiety at night, PTSD symptoms, people who are having nightmares or actually afraid to go to sleep because of nightmares or just depression related insomnia, feeling down, feeling depressed, loss of interest in things, loss of motivation to do things, feeling guilty or hopeless, you should seek mental health treatment. The gold standard treatments are sleep hygiene, which I'll go to in detail in a second. Two muscle relaxation techniques. One's called progressive muscle relaxation. Another one's autogenic. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Also CBTI for short. IRT, which is image rehearsal therapy, is specifically for nightmares. Typically used in PTSD, but can be used for people who just have a simple nightmare disorder. We do use medications, but they are definitely second line. The um, Department of Defense, the Veterans Affairs, as well as the Amer American Academy of Sleep recommends uh, the treatments that you see above that are non-pharmacologic before you start pharmacologic treatments. There are induction agents that can help you go to sleep and there are Prazosin and Seroquel that can help with nightmares. 
Um, I will not be talking about those today, but just to inform you that there are medications to help you sleep and talk to your doctor. Next slide. Sleep hygiene, these are preventative measures. These are things that you should do every day, like brushing your teeth, um, eating a healthy diet um, that prevent things from happening. So sleep hygiene is a good way from preventing bad sleep habits. Um, it does not alleviate the cause of insomnia. So if you're still having nightmares or a worrisome mind, you still need to seek treatment, but these are things that certainly help out. Next slide. This next slide, it's a little busy, but obviously environmental factors like our sleep partner snoring or rolling over can affect us. Alcohol will help people go to sleep, but it decreases the quality of sleep. Um, caffeine can obviously move our sleep onset back, and so we get less sleep, which is not good. Naps are good um, if you take them in less than 45 minutes and only if you need them. If you're a truck driver or somebody that needs to stay awake for a period of time and you need to stay awake and you're so tired, you're having problems with drowsiness and then take a nap less than 45 minutes, longer than 45 minutes, you, um, you can wake during sleep inertia, which is where you sleep, or I'm sorry, you wake up and you feel worse than when you went to take a nap. Um, don't watch the clock. A lot of people watch the clock and are like, oh, now I only have this many hours to sleep. Now I only have this many hours to sleep. I only have this many hours to sleep. Um, when you go to bed, turn the clock around, cover it up. Don't watch the clock. Um, white noise often helps. Um, that could be a noisemaker, a fan, static. Believe it or not, YouTube has um, white noise on there, and that's just something that can block out other noises that might stimulate you awake. Physical activity, we do recommend that you everybody work out. Everybody should be working out all the time. Um, as far as insomnia goes, it increases the sleep debt, meaning it makes you more tired, um, and so that you want to go to sleep after having worked out. However, there's, a, um, as you go to the far right of the slide at the bottom right, physical activity can interrupt temperature regulation. So as you go to sleep, your body needs to drop in temperature before you can go to sleep. Um, it's why it's difficult to fall asleep during hot evenings when you're unable to cool yourself off from air conditioner or, or other source. Um, so that's why we recommend that physical activity be early enough in the evening that it, you're cooled off that you can still fall asleep. Otherwise, it may have the effect of keeping you awake. Um, going to the right side of the slide, mental practice, I will talk about uh, some techniques we can use in a second. Go back one slide. Um, bed ergonomics, obviously have a nice bed that's not gonna hurt your back um, or your neck and allow you to um, sleep. Um, there's a slide on here uh, pointing to the laptop there's blue light that's emitted from electronic devices and that blue light um, is used to make the device energy efficient. That same blue light is also, uh, once it hits the, ret the back of your eyeball and your retina, it gets transmitted to the back of your brain, also decreases the production of melatonin. Melatonin is what's secreted to help you go to sleep. So if you decrease that production, it's harder to go to sl sleep. Um, keep a pad of paper by your bed and um, if you're having worries just jot down the worry so if that's a work project just put work project don't journal about the work project don't say how much you dislike your or like your boss um, but rather just put work project if there are things that you cannot forget for the next day such as a schedule or a briefing or an appointment write those things down so that they're there the next morning when you get up to say oh yeah I have an appointment at 8 30. Um, but make it brief. There's some kind of magic in handwriting things down versus typing them in your phone or uh, typing them in a schedule on a laptop. Um, it's better to handwrite them out. Um, another thing that's not on the slide that is very helpful is if anxiety is um, not your friend and is keeping you awake is to designate a time during the day called a worry time. Sounds very odd, but it's very effective where you take a period of time, usually can be as little as five minutes up to an hour. And during that time that 
that you schedule, you only worry during that time, not before that time, not after that time, but you focus on worrying so that during the day you can say, okay, I'm not going to worry about this now. I'm going to worry about this at 2 p.m. And for so many minutes, I'm going to worry. But then after that period of time is over, I am done worrying. Sounds strange, but it does work. Next slide. Two muscle relaxation techniques are recommended. One is called progressive muscle relaxation and the other one is autogenic muscle relaxation. Each technique must be practiced daily and be done at night. Like anything we do, if we wait until the time where we need to do it and we haven't practiced, our efficiency suffers. So recommend that you practice these daily and at night Studies show that there's improvement within two weeks, which is important to note that it's not going to be immediate. If you try this one or two days, do not expect to be, get better. However, over two weeks, you should expect to get better. There's two tricks to each of these. One is they are actually muscle relaxation techniques. Um, also, what usually happens with people is that they have a problem with their mind racing. And whether that be m racing about regret or worries or things they got to do the next day, their mind is racing and keeping them awake. So one of the, the designs of these muscle relaxations is not only to relax your muscles to make sleep easier to um, fall into, but also to uh, trick your mind into not focusing on those things that keep you awake. So rather than focusing on the boss or the job or the problems with the marriage or the kids or COVID, what you do is you focus on just relaxing. I'm just gonna relax. I feel myself relaxing. I hear myself relaxing. I hear my breath. And by focusing on that and not focusing on the worries of the day, you can induce sleep. Next slide. So progressive muscle relaxation is, prog is almost just what it says. It's progressively contracting and relaxing muscle groups and focusing on that tension and relaxation. And I think we've got a video which we'll play for about two to three minutes. So I'll be quiet for two to three minutes and then we'll come back and go into autogenic muscle relaxation. Begin by allowing your body to get more comfortable wherever you are right now. Take some full slow breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. Allow any distracting thoughts to come and go as if you're watching them floating down a stream and guide your attention back to your slow and easy breathing. When you're ready, breathe in and make a tight fist with your right hand. Hold and focus on what that tension feels like to you. Now, breathe out and release all the tension in the fist. Let your hand become nice and loose. Again, make a tight fist with the right hand and hold it. Then, let the tension and the hand relax fully. Focus on what your hand feels like to you when it is relaxed. Next, slowly breathe in and bring your right forearm up to your shoulder and tighten your upper arm. Hold. Now, breathe out and release. Again, make a muscle with your right arm. Hold and focus on what the tension feels like in your upper arm. Now, breathe out slowly and relax your arm.
breathe in. And now, make a tight fist with your left hand. Hold the tension. Exhale and release. Let the tightness and discomfort flow all the way out of your hand. Again, make a tight fist with your left hand and hold. Exhale and release. I think that's good. In again and bring them. So you get the picture. There's lots of um, YouTube videos that help with this um, to have you coach through it. It's helpful to have somebody coach and tell you when to breathe in and breathe out and how to which muscle groups to tense and which ones to relax. The autogenic relaxation technique is uh, similar. It focuses on making your body feel heavy and you sinking it, what they call sinking into the bed or the chair. Obviously, the last example was in a chair, but you could see how you could do this laying down as you're trying to um, go to sleep. With the autogenic relaxation technique, there's more of a focus on breathing, both focus on breathing. But again, if you're focused on breathing, how the breath is going in and out and focused, hard focused on how your chest wall rises and falls, how your breath goes in and out, how you feel heavy and focusing on feeling heavy, then you physically will become more relaxed, but also you're not concentrating on those things that may be keeping you awake, which are worries, concerns, anxiety, et cetera. And again, you need to practice this every day and um, you need some time for it to work. Usually that's two weeks, next slide. Or there's gonna be an example of autogenic uh, relaxation technique. Autogenic relaxation. Once you've found your most comfortable position, you might like to close your eyes and allow yourself to become aware of your breathing. Allow your breathing to become relaxed and comfortable. Can you turn it up a little bit, Jordan? Now slowly repeat the following phrases to your life. Staying quietly to your heart, not out there. You feel calm and quiet. You feel calm and quiet. You begin to feel more comfortable. I'm having a hard time hearing it, Jordan. Mm. Yeah. That's okay. So otherwise, this is called an autogenic muscle relaxation technique. Um, there's lots of examples of that on YouTube. Um, the biggest thing is, is that it concentrates on you becoming heavy and slow. I do encourage you to get um, uh, some kind of audio coach so that you can focus on the voice, you can focus on the relaxation, and you're not focused on those things that are worrying you. Another treatment is uh, called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, or CBTI. Um, it's divided into five sections, um, three of which are things that I've already discussed. Good sleep hygiene, 
uh, progressive and autogenic muscle relaxation techniques. And then the last part of it sets it apart is actually the cognitive therapies. And these are thoughts that directly interfere with sleep. So a common thought might happen, hey, if I don't get this briefing right, my boss will yell at me, I'll get a bad performance report, I won't get the promotion I need, I'll be fired from the company, and then I'll be living under a bridge. Um, and then that loop just plays and plays and plays and plays, or somebody's focused on how embarrassing the briefing will be. Um, this technique is where you work with your therapist to process and challenge those thoughts, such as maybe it'll be a great briefing. Maybe the boss will like it. Maybe the boss will not like, but also won't hate it. Uh, maybe the briefing will go well, you'll get promoted. Um, and so it goes on uh, um, about dealing with those cognitive distortions that might be happening. They're keeping people asleep. Some people uh, will have a cognitive distortion that I have insomnia, I will never go back to sleep. Well, that may not be true. Some people might have the fact that if I don't sleep tonight, tomorrow is going to be a wreck. Well, that may or may not be true. And so how to challenge that thought, how to calm that thought so that that thought isn't always keep popping up and keeping somebody awake. A new paragraph or next page. <laughs> so, um, imagery or solar therapy, IRT is a entity developed by Dr. Krakow, MD. He's an internal medicine doctor as well as a sleep doctor. And his idea was if we can push sleep uh, days residue, fancy word for those things that happen within our day that we dream about. So the boss yells at us and we have a dream about the boss yelling at us, or there's a test tomorrow and we dream about the test. That would is what we would call days residue. Like the things that are happening today are now my dreams. If the, the thing that's happening in my conscious day can be pushed into my unconscious sleep, he theorized that it may be if we focus on an image for the purpose of pushing that into the unconscious mind when we sleep, then maybe we can change or rid ourselves of nightmares. And fortunately, he was correct. And so he, what he postures and proposes, and this has been uh, proven study after study after study to be true, that if you rewrite the dream, handwritten, first person, present tense into a dream that you want to have doesn't have to be anything about the nightmare at all um, but a dream that the person wants to have that once that's scripted and in very uh, in much detail then the person reads that script to themselves four to five times per day and once at night and it abates nightmares the literature shows that in two to four weeks closer to two than four weeks uh, Ninety percent of people are able to show significant improvement. That is incredible. Very few things in medicine are ninety percent effective. Um, I have done this many times with my patients who suffer from nightmares. I have taught this to students um, of all kinds, and they have also seen that this is very, very, very effective. There are um, Dr. Krakow in his original work said this can be done in twelve sessions. In 2006, he wrote an article that said it can be done in four. Um, I propose that it can be done in as little as one to two. One to actually do the exercise and show the patient how to rewrite a dream. And the second appointment is just a follow up to see how they're doing. Um, and usually they're doing great. Um, so imagery rehearsal therapy by Dr. Krakow is something that can be done for people that have nightmares. Uh, next slide. Any questions? Um, before we get into questions, I do have handouts on sleep hygiene that go into much detail on how to do proper sleep hygiene, um, all the things that you need to do for your bed, your bedroom, your mind, your body uh, before you go to sleep to help uh, make sleeping easy, going to sleep and staying asleep easier for you. Um, and I am at the email below where you can email me in regards to any of these techniques. And I believe, Jordan, you have some questions for me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, once again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Scheidler. We, we absolutely appreciate, uh, you know, this amazing insight that you, you've offered. Um, 
as far as questions, uh, first and foremost, I know we, you touched on it in, um, um, in one of your slides, but, you know, if you could elaborate a little bit further on how does one know if they have insomnia? What are, what are the, the telltale signs and, you know, what are, you know, some distinguishing features of it? Yeah, good question. So it's pretty uh, obvious um, that you cannot go to sleep or you cannot get quality sleep. Again, insomnia is different from other sleep disorders such as sleep apnea and sleepwalking and things like that where uh, people actually sleep. They just don't get good quality sleep. But with insomnia, people actually know, hey, I am not going to sleep or I am waking up in the middle of the night and not easily going back to sleep to the point that it affects my day the next day. And how could one find out or determine whether or not they're getting good enough sleep? Uh, good question. So the average, the literature out there says, and you'll hear often that people need six to eight hours of sleep. That is a bell curve, which means some people need less and some people need more. So each individual person, um, one of the crude ways to judge how much sleep a person needs, assuming they can go to sleep and they can stay asleep and they do not have insomnia, is for them to go to bed at a reasonable hour not to be disturbed by pets, babies, kids, partners, anything else, and see when they would naturally wake up if there's no alarms, no kids, no dogs, nothing that'll wake them up and see when they naturally wake up. That will be a good indicator of how much sleep they need. Case in point, I need 10 hours of sleep. Um, I'm one of the people on the far side of the bell curve. Most people need six to eight. Some people need as little as three. But the other indicator of how much sleep you need is do you wake rested when you wake up do you feel like i slept number one two and my mind and body are mentally prepared for the day i'm not tired or um um what we call um you get you get good quality restful sleep the um those are the two big indicators. If you're falling asleep during, again, if you're falling asleep during boring briefings or you have a hard time staying awake during times where you're not, there's not much stimulation, such as briefings, writing in the passenger in a car, watching TV by yourself, um, having a big lunch and having trouble staying awake. Those are all factors that indicate that you may not be getting enough sleep or that you have poor quality sleep um, in addition to what people will readily knows that they're not falling asleep. And actually, I, I know you touched on it in one of your previous slides, but uh, if you could elaborate a little bit further on, you know, taking naps. I mean, to, to, to your point earlier, I mean, uh, you know, I believe you said something to the effect of uh, 45 minutes uh, or less, but, uh, you know, it, it, so is it okay to take naps during the day? And, you know, if it is, you know, what is, is there an ideal time? Is there an uh, ideal time frame to take, it, uh, take a nap? And is there an ideal time a day where you would take a nap? Um, good question. So usually we do not recommend taking naps. And the reason is, is if you take a nap, then your body at the time that it should fall asleep is like, hey, I've already got some rest. And then you will stay up and then you start to cycle over again about not getting enough sleep. However, if you are somebody that needs to go to sleep um, and have some kind of mental rest and physical rest, such as truck drivers, um, then we recommend taking a nap less than 45 minutes. And there's um, some studies out there that show 20 minutes is enough. Um, you do want to do it less than 45 minutes because the normal sleep cycle, it goes into 60 to 90 minutes. So somebody can wake up during a deep sleep, in which case they're going to feel as sleepy or even more sleepy than they did before they went to bed because they woke up in the middle of a deep sleep cycle. And then they'll have what's called sleep inertia. It's hard to wake up. It's hard to get going. It's hard to think. Um, it's hard to get motivated. So we, if you have to have to take a nap, then 45 minutes. One of the sleep hygiene recommendations is no naps so that when it's time to go to bed, you are tired and then you will fall asleep. Um, so generally do not recommend naps, but if you need to take a nap, 
that it's 45 minutes or less. And uh, in terms of specific things or activities, uh, you know, one should avoid uh, that might disturb your other uh, sleep. There was that slot, that, that great slide you had earlier uh, with a, a lot of different suggestions in there. But are there particular activities or, you know, habits that, you know, I mean, traditionally, you know, a lot of us may have uh, that would disturb someone's, uh, someone being able to get a good quality sleep? So good question. And you're correct. I, some of the things I talked about, so caffeine intake will keep people awake. Taking certain medications like stimulants late in the day will keep people awake. Um, also, um, counterintuitively, alcohol will help people relax and go to sleep, but alcohol actually pushes REM sleep to the end of sleep. And it does so so much that you can end up with no REM sleep and so no deep sleep, which is restorative sleep. So although alcohol can help people go to sleep, it destroys what we call the architecture of sleep, which thereby um, makes the sleep a poor quality. So drinking and drinking alcohol of any amount can push the push REM sleep to the end of um, the sleep period of time. Uh, also, um, uh, believe it or not, uh, warm showers. So warm showers actually sometimes relax people. And again, that's a bell curve. Sometimes it relaxes people, but sometimes it wakes them up. And that goes back to the temperature regulation of your body temperature needs to drop at night before you go to bed. And so if you're taking a hot shower and you're warm and feeling cozy inside, you may actually be preventing your temperature to drop to the point where it's difficult to go to sleep. The, um, there's um, some, the details in the, um, another one is a lot of times people will say, well, I'm going to go to bed and go to sleep, go to sleep. But they know that they're probably going to be there a half hour, hour, hour and a half, two hours, either fighting sleep or doing something in, in bed. Unfortunately, what happens is the mind gets tricked into, hey, this bed and bedroom is not someplace I sleep and have sex. This is where I do work. This is where I do Facebook. This is where I watch TV. This is where I read. And so what happens is, is the body's not conditioned to fall asleep. And so what we recommend is that if you're not tired or you're not falling asleep to get out of bed and go do something that's non-stimulating, such as a simple crossword puzzle or a boring book, but not stay in bed and try to fall asleep, but get out of the bed and bedroom. Perfect. And uh, the last question I have uh, uh, on this list, actually, um, of course, with, uh, with a lot of the slides you talked about, there is a lot of mention of treating insomnia. And, you know, after you, after you have insomnia or after you, you've been diagnosed with it, uh, or after you've seen somebody for it, uh, this is what you do. But, um, you know, one thing I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit further on is, uh, are there is there a way to prevent insomnia before it even becomes something that you would have to see a clinician for or have to go see a doctor for? Well, I, I would say that um, the ways to prevent it are through the sleep hygiene techniques. So kind of like you're asking me, how do we prevent sleep problems it's like asking how do you prevent cavities so you do this preventive measures brush your teeth in the case of um, dental disease but in the case of sleep you do sleep hygiene things you don't drink you don't drink alcohol uh, before bed you don't take uh, stimulants before bed um, and the other things that we've already talked about but if it gets to the point where your mind's racing and your sleep is affecting your quality of life, it's affecting your relationships, it's affecting your job, or more importantly, it hasn't, but it might affect those, that's the time to seek mental health help to make sure that there's not an underlying um, mental health or medical problem that we can um, take care of and help people get good quality sleep and therefore have productive lives. 
perfect. Dr. Scheidler, thank you so much for this, uh, this amazing presentation. And uh, once again, for those tuning in, uh, we do have uh, some uh, extended reading materials uh, on sleep hygiene uh, with plenty of uh, tips and uh, tricks and treatments that you could go uh, that you could use in order to improve your quality of sleep. Uh, for anyone interested in uh, in those handouts or receiving those handouts, and for anybody who is interested or has any other questions uh, that they want to ask regarding uh, insomnia and, and their quality of sleep, uh, I, I've left this uh, this uh, this slide up uh, specifically for anybody who would like a chance to write down Dr. Scheidler's uh, email address. Uh, but once again, uh, thank you all so much again for uh, tuning in to this, uh, this seminar, Insomnia 101. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Scheidler. Thank you. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great day.